Welcome to the Thrive TV Show with Lauren Parsons, helping you boost your health, energy, and productivity. Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Thrive TV Show. I'm Lauren Parsons, your host, and today I'm joined by Michelle McQuaid, who's connecting all the way from Toronto, Canada. Hi, Michelle. Hey, Lauren. Great to be here with you. Really nice to connect, and if you recognize Michelle's accent, you might hear she's not actually Canadian, she is Australian, uh, but living in Toronto. And today we're talking about the surprising truths about caring for well-being. Michelle has got a really interesting background researching and speaking and training around well-being, both for individuals and workplaces. So today we're going to talk about why well-being comprises moments of thriving and struggle and what to do about it how it comprises multiple factors and how you can measure and care for them and how it has ebbs and flows and why tiny is mighty. So before we get into all of that, Michelle, can I just do my this and that questions with you? Go for it. So tell me, spots or stripes? Oh, stripes. Stripes, okay. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Would you rather be invisible or be able to fly? Oh, fly. <laughs> Nice. Would you rather be able to play 10 musical instruments beautifully or speak 10 languages fluently? 10 musical instruments. Oh, nice. Uh, tell me, beach or mountaintop? Beach, always. <laughs> nice. And jeans or skirt? Jeans. Okay. And cake or chocolate? Oh, chocolate. <laughs> nice. So Michelle McQuay, just to get to know her a little more, she's a well-being researcher, best-selling author, and a playful change advocator, which I like, or playful change activator, which I love. Uh, Dr. Michelle McQuaid is passionate about translating cutting-edge research into actionable and measurable strategies that build thriving workplaces, flourishing schools, stronger communities, and healthier lives. So we are so aligned. It's such a pleasure to finally meet you. So Michelle, can you just tell us briefly, how did you get into what you're doing now? Yeah, I grew up in large organisations like IBM and PricewaterhouseCoopers, the big auditing and accounting firm, mostly in branding roles. And of course, in big services firms like PricewaterhouseCoopers, your people are your brand. And so their behaviours and how do you help get them to live the company values as they go about their jobs and how you bring out the best in them for your clients each day was a big focus of our branding work. And I was in a global role for PwC and travelling in and out of different leadership teams all over the world and seeing how different teams tried to meet those challenges and realising that a lot of what we do didn't really work very well. We got compliance but not often commitment and when leadership attention moved on on to the next thing, often people went back to what they'd been previously doing. And so that got me curious, like what else was the science learning about human behaviour and how to bring out the best in people at work? Uh, around that time, we were living in New York and uh, for the first time in the history of Harvard, a course had become more popular than economics and that course was positive psychology. Yeah. And so it was getting a lot of airplay and it was actually on the John Stewart kind of comedian late night show uh, that I I came across uh, Dr. Tel Ben Shahar, who was the uh, professor for that program, and suddenly discovered there was this science to human thriving and why I never heard this and started devouring everything I could get my hands on about it. And gladly, PricewaterhouseCoopers were very interested in it. So I went and did my master's at the University of Pennsylvania and was given free reign to see if any of it would work in the auditing firm. And I think if you can try to make something like positive psychology work in an auditing firm, Firm, you can make it work anywhere. So, right. <laughs> so that was how I end up really interested in both the science and the application of the science in workplaces. Mm, fantastic. And yeah, huge, huge fan of positive psychology as well. And it's just amazing, isn't it, when we think we can raise the bar for the human condition. So tell me, you said that well-being is about thriving and struggling. Mm -hmm. And what do we do about that? Can you unpack that for us? Yeah, so I think, again, some of the names like positive psychology and well-being are sometimes a little misleading and have gotten us a bit confused over the last decade that in order to be well, we must be thriving, we must be flourishing, um, we must be well, or otherwise surely we're ill is the other alternative, right? Mm. And the reality is uh, what we see in our research but other researchers are also finding is that when it comes to caring, 
caring for our well-being. Not only is it normal, but it's incredibly healthy that we are going to experience moments of thriving and moments of struggle. And being well doesn't preclude having those moments of struggle. In fact, I'm sure we can all relate that some of the moments of struggle we've experienced have actually been really important for our learning and growth in order to be well in healthier ways on the other side of those experiences. Mm -hmm. And so we've certainly seen in our research, we do large population studies with workers all over the world. Uh, But again, we know in our colleague studies as well, that often unintentionally, intentionally when we introduce workplace wellbeing programs and we only talk about the being well, the thriving, the flourishing part of it, we can actually unintentionally do damage to people's wellbeing. Mm -hmm. And so we just think about that for a moment and know that in any workplace population, we will have people who are really struggling. And if we're really struggling, it probably took everything in us just to get out of bed today and show up to work. And then we get to work and we're all going to be well, we're all going to be thriving, it's going to be amazing. Um, It's like, are you kidding? Like it took everything just to get here. Mm -hmm. And so what we see happening for people who are really struggling in those moments is often it comes laden with embarrassment, shame, feelings of isolation, what's wrong with me, I don't want to thrive, or my colleagues are excited about being well. I just want to go back to bed. So we need to be careful that we're not unintentionally doing harm with our enthusiasm uh, for wanting to support people's well-being. And so we've certainly found, even pre the global pandemic, but certainly in the last two years since that has all unfolded, that probably the lowest hanging fruit in any workplace wellbeing program we have available to us is to just normalise struggle as a perfectly healthy part of caring for our wellbeing rather than adding to the feelings of shame or isolation people may encounter when they're struggling. I'll just give one last note on that. In the research, it's been really interesting to see that we have people sort of describe, I'm consistently thriving, I'm feeling on top of the world, I'm living well despite struggle, I'm not feeling bad, but I'm just getting by or I'm really struggling. And what we find statistically is not only for well-being, but for workplace outcomes like engagement, performance, commitment to organisation job satisfaction is people who are consistently thriving and people who are living well despite struggle show no real difference in those workplace outcomes. So it's absolutely possible to be struggling and still be doing really well on all fronts. In fact, over COVID, we found those people living well despite struggle were the most resilient workers in any setting. And so, again, the more we can normalise struggle, the more we make it possible for those resilient workers to get the benefits that that resilience brings for them and the teams and their organisations. But if struggle is kind of seen as something you don't do here because we're all well, we're all thriving, then we actually see those benefits don't translate for resilient workers either. So there's both an individual and an organisational lens to why we want to normalise thriving and struggle, being normal and healthy parts of caring for our well-being. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I think that's probably a light bulb, you know, moment for people listening and that perhaps haven't viewed it that way. I think it's so true. It's so important to realise we can all you know, move up and down the mental health continuum. We can all have tough days or tough months. So what would you say to people that do, as they're listening to this, feel like they are struggling and perhaps their workplace isn't supportive of them right now? What would you say to that person? What can they do? Yeah, so firstly, there is nothing wrong with you. Struggle is our body's way of letting us know that something important is unfolding around us and it needs our attention. That's Mm. why it feels so uncomfortable, right? It's why we get anxious. It's why we feel stressed. It's why we feel lots of those uncomfortable emotions. It's just our body's way of trying to, like, ring that internal alarm bell to go, hey, pay attention here. Something needs your, you know, your help to move forward. So there's nothing wrong with you. You are not broken. You are not in need of fixing. You are experiencing a perfectly natural, normal, healthy thing that all of us experience at some times, 
some of us more than others. So, so that would be number one. Um, and then number two, that when we're struggling, we do tend to need a hand. So if you don't feel safe to ask for that support at your workplace, perhaps there's somebody outside of work that you can talk to and you just say, hey, I'm really struggling right now. I, I'm feeling this or I'm finding this hard or I feel like it would be good if I got a bit of support on. We definitely see that people who have some level of psychological safety where they have someone they can talk to honestly about what's working well and it might only be that what's working well for your well-being right now is that I'm willing to be honest about the fact I'm struggling that's okay <laughs> but you may find there are other things as well where am I struggling and what with right we want the full picture here not just the things that aren't working but what is because that might give us clues as to what we can build on and most importantly, what am I learning, right? Wellbeing is always a snapshot of one moment in time. It's ebbing and flowing, coming and going, sometimes all in the matter of minutes, right? Yeah. And so knowing that at this moment in time, what am I learning about caring for my wellbeing and what I need in this context for support that I could take forward? And is there someone I need to ask for help? Or is that something I can try a few little things tomorrow and see what impact that has? And at the end of the day, I'll ask again, what went well? Where did I struggle? What did I learn? The real goal when it comes to caring for our well-being isn't that we've all got exceptional high levels of well-being all the time. It's mm -hmm. that we're trying to become more intelligent and effective in caring for our well-being day to day, no matter what's happening in the world around us. And so sometimes we're going to nail it and other days we're going to feel wo fall woefully short. And that's okay. Yeah. That <laughs> makes absolute sense. And I feel like that, that releases a lot of pressure. You know, we talk about toxic positivity, that it's not like I've got to pretend to be positive all the time because that just doesn't work. You know, tough stuff happens in life and we face challenges and tragedies and it just doesn't make sense to pretend to be positive at those times. So I like that acknowledging when you are struggling. And I think sometimes that, you know, that takes courage to do that. And so it's, again, it's like a muscle we can work. And the more that we get used to doing that, having that person to talk to, so key. Yeah, very much. So you talked about well-being having ebbs and flows. And yeah. that, what was your saying? That tiny is mighty so can you just explain that for me yeah yeah so nobody's well-being is constantly going up when we measure it and if it was I'd be a little bit worried over time that either you were disconnected from reality <laughs> or you didn't feel safe to tell us what was really happening we measure well-being all over the world and so we know that if you were doing up 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 for sort of two three four five years all the time I'd be like mm, what's happening back there um, what we see and what is very normal is more that most of us have a fairly healthy set point range for well-being. So if I was to measure you from zero to 10, most of us would sit around seven out of 10. We are wired to be pretty well and to be pretty resilient is the good news. <laughs> that said, there's also a pretty natural range around that kind of set point of well-being of about 10%, that you'll go up and down a little bit around that fairly natural set point you might have. And so, again, if I was measuring your well-being on a 10-point scale and I saw you coming down to sort of six or up to eight, I'd be like, well, that's kind of expected. If I saw you dropping a lot below six, I might be what's happening? Are you okay? Is there some support that we need right now? If I saw you at 10 all the time, I'd be like, what's happening? Are you okay? <laughs> Is there some support you need right now? But most of us do this. Yeah, there's some fairly natural ebb and flowing to well-being. And sometimes as the world around us changes, like with the global pandemic, we may experience real downfalls or real spikes, you know, when something exciting is happening in our life, um, you know, a new relationship or a job that we're loving or, you know, something's happening in our family that's super exciting. But those circumstantial kind of peaks and troughs that we experience tend to normalise back towards that common range. Mm -hmm. So then how do we navigate the ebb and flow um, day to day so that we're trying to move more towards the top of our set point range for well-being and less towards the bottom of that range. Um, and so what we find in the research is actually doesn't need to be big things that we're doing for our well-being, but tiny little day things that we can do consistently have a massive impact when it comes to caring for our well-being. Mm -hmm. um, this is the research of Professor BJ Fogg at Stanford University. He has a 
great book out called Tiny Habits a couple of years ago around this if you're wanting to dive in more of it. But again, often we find that when it comes to caring for our well-being, people set goals that are too big, yes. they go at it too hard, and they expect results too fast. And then we could go, oh, you know, this is the news resolution. We're all going to get fit this year. And then, you know, within a couple of weeks, it's like, oh, it's too hard. Never mind that gym membership. We're all back on the couch. Yeah. And so, you know, BJ's research would say, start tiny, find something you want to do. Like if it's getting more exercise, for example. So not that you have to, or you should do, or you must do, but you want to do. And then shrink it. Make sure that you're able to do it successfully most days. And so BJ would suggest if you're going to try to get more exercise in, your tiny well-being nudge might just be putting your exercise shoes on each morning and then you could declare success. Even if you didn't take a single step, be like, I'm there, I did it, look at me go. <laughs> and what his research has found is that number one, as you might expect, most of us who managed to get the exercise shoes on at that point go, oh, might as well take a few steps. <laughs> and once we start taking a few steps, all those happy chemicals start to go and say, oh, might as well take a few steps more. So we start to build often the activities over time because they're chemically rewarding for us and we feel confident that we can do so. But even if we can't, what BJ's research finds is more important than running five kilometres every day is the fact that you're in a regular pattern of trying to get out and exercising and that you celebrate what you did immediately. So really interesting studies from BJ Fogg and others at the moment around self-regulation and self-control that's showing that the people that are most consistent in looking after their well-being aren't the most self-disciplined, but it's actually that they use that surge of positive emotion, that feeling of, woohoo, I did it, you know, high five me, pat on the back, tick it off the list, um, that that, you know, happy chemicals release the dopamine in our brain which means the next time we get our nudge to go out and do that uh, well-being habit again, we're much more likely to follow through on it because it feels good for us to stick with those things. So that's the tiny is mighty. And often we find people are not thinking tiny enough. And so we've got to shrink it down, shrink it down. It's more important to be consistently successful at something small than it is to be tackling something big that you can only stick with for short periods of time. Absolutely agree. Yeah. And it's so interesting because I'm so interested in this whole area of human behavior and habit change like yourself, Michelle, because it is so interesting. And I often find that same thing that it's talking to people and people feel like I've got to say, oh, I'm going to run three lunch times this week or, <laughs> oh, I'm not drinking much water. I'm going to drink three liters of water, Lauren, starting tomorrow. You know, yeah. it's like <laughs> trying to climb a mountain without having done any training. So I love that you're reinforcing that message of start small and if it still seems like it might be a challenge make it smaller make it tiny so that you feel like you cannot fail and and we know that that's going to create that success loop of oh I did it hey I got the shoes on or hey you know I just looked up the options of dance classes you know just what's the one baby step the tiny step that you can take so I love yes, that totally. and we know that that's going to yeah create that you know that one percent change that James Clear talks about over time that will transform our habits over time so really great advice there Michelle thank you I wondered yeah. about I wanted to talk about the pandemic as well because I feel like Never before have we had people just saying that they're so exhausted and, you know, I think people's resilience has, you know, been beaten up and beaten around. What would you say to people that are feeling like they are just languishing at the moment? Mm -hmm. Where should they start? Yeah. So I think one of the things we've perhaps come to appreciate more as a result of the global pandemic is that rest and recovery is as important when it comes to caring for our well-being as all the activities that we, you know, sign ourselves up for. And so just being really gentle with ourselves. Again, when we feel like we're languishing, we're exhausted, we're feeling overwhelmed, our body's actually trying to send us really important information to stop and to just, you know, invest in a little bit of care for self until we're ready to go again. And unfortunately, in our very busy worlds, often we've been learned, often we've been taught not to listen to those signs or to override them and keep going no matter what um, mm. until we do hit that uh, burnout stage. And so just honour what your body's telling you. If you feel like you're languishing, you feel like you're struggling, you feel like you're exhausted, hey, thank you, body, for letting me know I need some rest and recovery right now. And know that taking that rest and recovery is 
as important for caring for your well-being, for supporting your performance, for showing up in your relationships, both at work and outside of work, as anything else you can do. Maybe you don't need that 5K run today. You actually need to stay in bed for a little bit of a sleep in. <laughs> or, you know, maybe it's not counting your blessings that night, but maybe it's, you know, some slow meditative breathing that's actually just going to give you a bit of uh, rest and relaxation. So just honour that rather than overriding it goes a very long way for all of us. I do think, though, there's an interesting piece again in our um, language and the way we think about it. I mentioned earlier, we've seen over the course of the global pandemic that resilience in people, our ability to live well despite struggle has mm -hmm. actually increased significantly more than anything else. We've seen these resilient workers kind of emerge um, in our populations. And that's awesome. Again, uh, workplaces want more resilient workers. That is where we're trying to get ourselves to. And Rest and recovery is as much a part of our resilience as is the gritting and the powering through and all those other good things that we do. And so one of the other things we do see in resilient workers is they know when they need to stop and they actually give themselves the permission to do so, not seeing it as soft or weak or a cop-out for the fact that they need to honour their requirements for rest and recovery uh, to look after themselves. And so, again, I think, you know, so the more that we can normalise struggle and resilience going hand in hand, um, the better it is for all of us. Mm, fantastic. No, no, there's lots of different ways to really define well-being. So, Michelle, interested to hear what are the factors that you feel comprise well-being? And I know you talked about different ways to measure those and influence those. So can you outline what are the factors for you? Yeah, so uh, we've been fortunate enough to create the PERMA Wellbeing Survey uh, with Dr Peggy Kern at the University of Melbourne, um, based on the work of Dr Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania, who's seen as one of the founders of the field of positive psychology and one of the leaders in the science of wellbeing. And so the definition that we like for wellbeing um, first starts with Professor Felicia Huppert, who suggests that wellbeing is our ability to feel good. It's kind of that happiness up there factor that we often associate with well-being but to also function effectively which is where the thriving and the struggles start to come hand in hand and if we look at well how do we operationalize that that all sounds you know simple enough but like what do we do practically to get there um, Professor Seligman's perma well-being theory suggests that there are six factors uh, that we want to think about measuring and prioritizing when it comes to looking after ourselves the first is positive emotion that's the P in perma and here I would also add the uncomfortable or the negative emotions as well. I think the whole emotional intelligence part um, is so key, right, to understand what our bodies are trying to tell us and how that works. Engagement, do we have a chance to do what we do best each day? Do we use those neurological superpowers we all have? Relationships, can we have healthy connections with others? Meaning, do we have a sense of purpose? And do we have balance in that so it's not burning ourselves out? We often hear of compassion fatigue but actually what we see more of is passion fatigue where the sense yeah. of what I'm doing is so meaningful and purposeful I can't turn off from my job and so I'm burning myself out um, accomplishment can we achieve the things that matter most to us and again in there lots of self-compassion rather than self-criticism and then physical health yes the eat move sleep but also the rest and recovery as we talked about so the perma wellbeing survey is a free five minute tool anyone can play with or you can have your whole team or workplace do it and it measures these six well-being factors and how you're doing and if you use it as a team how you're doing individually but also as a team and organization as well and then there are hundreds of amazing little tiny as mighty well-being nudges that you can use in any of those factors for yourself or your team to help care for well-being. Mm, fantastic yeah I've long been a follower of Martin Seligman's work and his PERMA model and I've heard it also as the PERMA V with a V for vitality yeah. which is maybe some vitality yeah instead, instead of the physical, physical health on the end yeah yeah <laughs> so it is it's a really fantastic holistic model to look at at human flourishing and as you say that, that tension between struggling and thriving. And I have to say, I really love the tiny habits. Also, I'm not sure if you know, Michelle, but the TED talk that I did was around this concept to snack on exercise. And really, mm -hmm. there's lots of things in life that we, we can be snacking on, you know, adding in sure. micro movements or micro mindfulness, things like that. The whole idea is, what could you do in a minute? And, and could you yeah. perhaps fit in 
short bursts of a minute of movement throughout your day just to boost how you're feeling. And I think the more that we can adopt these tiny habits that we can integrate into our busy, 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 busy lives, the more we can make it happen. Because I think often we... um, we look at the picture, the the perfect picture of like, I'm going to go somewhere, I'm going to get changed and I'm going to do my workout and then I'm going to shower. And, and because that then puts this big constraint around it, it ends up in the two hard basket. So I encourage our listeners to also listen into the Joy Choice interview that I did with Dr. Michelle Seeger, which is she's all about, you know, what is the perfect, imperfect choice that I can do today? You know, oh, I don't have a half an hour to go for that run, but I've got 10 minutes. So I'm going to head out and just get out for a walk for 10 minutes rather than feeling like, oh, it's all or nothing thinking, that flexible thinking. Yeah, Yeah. some minutes are always better than no minutes when it comes to caring for our well-being. Yeah, fantastic. So tell me, I'd love to hear perhaps if you've got any stories or examples. I don't know if you have success stories from from clients, perhaps leaders you've worked with, organisations. Really interested to hear some of the examples of where people have been taking action on this research, Michelle. Yeah, so we work with all sorts of clients all over the world, uh, big and small companies. Um, But in particular, one of our uh, clients that we've been doing a lot with the last few years is a large superannuation client in Australia. And so they started by having their teams complete the PERMA survey. So they kind of knew where they were at individually and as teams. And then we've been running sort of tiny uh, nudges, we call them tiny wellbeing nudge sessions, where we've been introducing them to different evidence based ways that they could individually start to work on their tiny wellbeing behaviours that were important to them and really trying to build this shared evidence based toolbox of nudges that people can pick and choose from based on what's meaningful. Um, We know it's not a one size fits all thing when it comes to caring for wellbeing. And so having that flexibility is such an important piece. And again, people have chosen all sorts of things from, um, you know, figuring out what their strengths are around that engagement well-being factor and then using their diaries or their daily planning tools to note, you know, one of their strengths next to one of those tasks that perhaps they're not looking forward to so much so that they can turn a to-do into a ta-da, as we like to say. Um, They've also been looking then as teams, how can we start to support each other's well-being better? And so one of the things uh, teams in that organisation, many of them have adopted is as part of their regular meeting agendas to support the accomplishment pillar, that safe learning culture to build psychological safety around mistakes and failures and the like, is Mm. to lead off all their team meetings with what they call a learning loop that we introduced to them. And it's just those three simple questions we were playing with before around struggle of what's going well at the moment for us as a team, where are we struggling and what are we learning? And so they found this a really powerful way to normalise conversations about struggle, to make that safe and okay, to focus not just on the performance outcomes but the learning that they're gaining along those journeys with each other. And so often we'll work with our clients to go, okay, there's all of this amazing research and all these little ways that we can apply it, but what is most meaningful and important for you at this time? And then how do we keep supporting that as we go along? So, you know, whether that might be having some wellbeing check-ins or teaching them as a group to be able to do that for each other um, or having some leadership coaching or the like, because again, without some of that accountability and that commitment to keep learning, we know it's easy for these things to drift away and so they also continue to use the PERMA survey they've been doing that now for a number of years as a way to sort of every six months check back in on what impact is this having for our teams you know what next do we want to prioritize and really again to be working towards that goal to be intelligent carers of their well-being rather than expecting this is going to be a one and done exercise which of course we know caring for well-being never is (laughs) yeah fantastic I really love the idea of that and learning loop and those questions so what's working well what are we struggling with and what are we learning and I think particularly you know throughout this whole global pandemic constantly been asking that question okay what am I learning right now yeah (laughs) I could just fast forward my thinking to five years down the track when we look back on this period of time what will we have learned you know how can we fast forward that thinking to about to start applying it now I think is is a really great practical way to take action, as you say, to bring our struggles more into the open. Really, really practical idea. I love it. Thank you. (laughs) 
So, Michelle, as we, you know, start wrapping up, just keen to hear if people wanted to find out more about you or get in touch, how can they do that? Yeah, so again, the Perma Wellbeing Survey is free, takes five minutes, anyone can go have a play with it. You'll find it at perma, P-E-R-M-A-H, survey.com, or head on over to michellemcquade.com. Uh, we have a website with more than 250 podcasts from uh, wellbeing and positive psychology researchers all over the world and lots of other free research and tools there that you can find to play with. Fantastic. And if you're just tuning in to the podcast version of Thrive TV, feel free to head to thrivetvshow.com and you'll be able to watch the TV version and see Michelle's beautiful smile and just as she's been describing everything. And also all of the show notes will be down below with those links so you can connect in. So thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Michelle, just to wrap up, if I can invite you to share, you know, what is one final thing you'd love to share with the listeners today? What would that be? I think, again, it's just that giving ourselves permission to struggle, to remember that we are all perfectly imperfect. None of us have it all figured out most of the time. (laughs) And so just, yeah, being gentle with ourselves and embracing those imperfections, I think goes a long way towards caring for our well-being. Mm. And I also want to ask you, what would you say to the leader in the organisation who's listening into this thinking, oh, okay, maybe we need to do something around this. We actually want to make a a lasting difference to workplace wellbeing. What would you say to them about perhaps why they should do this or, or what they can do? Yeah, we often work with leaders to help them think about how they are leading well-being, um, using LEAD here as a little acronym. Um, And so we often encourage you to think about what's the language for the L for LEAD um, that you have. Do you have a common language? It's hard to talk about well-being if we don't have a shared language. And well-being is one of those things that we all generally understand, but we could all be talking about very different things when we get into it. So, you know, thinking about the language your team has for well-being, Thriving and struggle being a really simple place to start. How are you evaluating well-being within your team? Um, are you using engagement surveys, something like the PERMA survey or other tools out there? Again, it's hard to care for what you don't track. Um, and so we do see evaluation as an important part. How are you activating it? What's that evidence-based toolbox you're making available? We often say at the me, the individual level, but the we, the leader and team level, and the us, the organisational level as well. And then the D is how you're going to sustain determination because we say, well-being is not one woohoo and done <laughs> and so how do you build that social support and social accountability to keep showing up day after day to care for well-being and so we find this is a good little checklist for leaders to think holistically um, about their well-being approach rather than just we'll put on another workshop or we'll learn to meditate or we'll do some deep breathing all those things are great but in isolation often don't have the intended impact that leaders are hoping for. Mm, fantastic yeah very wise indeed well thank you so much Michelle I'm sure that people that are listening in will have got a lot for themselves and also hopefully some ideas to bring back to your organization so thank you for your time Michelle yes so welcome Lauren thank you for having me so that's been another episode of the Thrive TV show go out and struggle and thrive thank you for listening to the Thrive TV show with Lauren Parsons Visit thrivetvshow.com to access the show notes and discover our fantastic bonus content. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next inspiring episode.